In the past, the Institute has contributed much to the security and knowledge of this Republic. The men of this Institute probe far beyond the existing frontier of man's knowledge. This is a brief report on the work and purpose of the Institute as seen through the eyes and mind of one man, its director, Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer, a physicist. Dr. Oppenheimer, why don't we begin by uh, your telling me a little about this Institute for Advanced Study, how it began. Well, I, I'll, I'll try. Of course, it began at a time when I wasn't anywhere near. And uh, it's already a subject for historical research. I, I'm about to find someone to see if we can find out how it began. Uh, I've heard you describe it as a decompression chamber. Uh, well, it is for many people. Uh, there are no telephones ringing, and you don't have to go to committee meetings, and you don't have to meet classes. And the, it's especially for the few people who are here for life, the first years are quite, quite remarkable, because m most people depend on being interrupted <laughs> in order to live. <laughs> but the work is so hard, and, and uh, failure is, is, of course, I guess an inevitable condition of, of success. Uh, so they're used to, to having to go to, to attend to other people's business. When they get here, there's nothing of that, and uh, they, they, they can't run away. It's to, to help men who are creative and deep and active and struggling scholars and scientists uh, to get the job done that it is their destiny to do. Uh, this is a big order, and we take a corner of it. We do the best we can. We, we suffer from limits of money, of wisdom, of space, and we know that if we get big, we, we will spoil everything because the kind of intimacy, the kind of understanding, the kind of comradeship that is possible in a place of this size is hard to maintain in a place ten times as big. But... Uh, we are here as an institution, I don't mean in our individual capacities, but as an, as an institution, uh, we are here to take away from men the cares, the pleasures that are their normal excuse for not following the rugged road of their own, own life and need and destiny. Well, w w would you tell me something about the permanent members of the staff, the faculty? Uh, some are pure mathematicians. This was the first and, uh, I guess, the most illustrious field in which the Institute entered. And uh, there's Hassler Whitney, who was a man who spent most of his life at Harvard, uh, an extraordinarily imaginative and creative man whose field, it won't mean much, his field is... Is, is essentially topology. Uh, what exactly is that? Well, it is a study of those relationships which do not have to do with measure and size, but with shape and arrangement. Uh -huh. uh, let me digress. We had here this year um, a Swiss, a French-Swiss psychologist, he is almost a philosopher, uh, called Piaget, whose work has been on the on the way children learn to think, uh, how they learn notions of cause, notions of time, uh, notions of necessity, notions of number, all the things that Kant thought you were born with. Well, they, no. uh, you're not born with them, you learn them. And uh, he made one discovery, which is not surprising, uh, but a little odd. Uh, he found out those things which in normal mathematical instruction are the most highbrow, are the things the children know first. Children know first whether objects are inside each other or separate, whether they can be deformed into each other. And these are the notions that topology deals with. Uh -huh. They learn later that the length of a line is so, or that a figure has seven sides and not six. All the things that have to do with number come later. But the things that have to do with relatedness, the fact that a donut can't be turned into a sphere without tearing it, you see. Yeah. This kind of thing the child knows, and these, these logical notions, I mentioned only trivial ones, are the basis of topology. Uh -huh. then, uh, then there are two men, one a, one a Norwegian and one a Swede, but there is no conspiracy <laughs> here, um, who, are, who are analysts and uh, have done 
very great work in analytic number theory, Selbert and Girling. Um, there's Marston Morse, who's a very distinguished and, and, uh, and large mathematician, has worked in many different fields, and uh, so I hate to say it, he, he is a, a, almost a statesman of mathematics. There are, uh, there's Dean Montgomery, who solved a famous problem of Riemann, which I'm not going to define, uh, and astonished us all a few years ago. There are two physicists, and there will shortly, I think, be more, uh, both young, one a Dutchman, Pais, and one an Englishman, Dyson, uh, both of whom, in quite different ways, are struggling with the problems that interest me. Uh, there's Panofsky, uh, who is a historian of art. He has two kids, two boys, uh, both physicists, and they were very, very bright boys, and one of them uh, was first in his class at Princeton, the other second. They call one the bright Panofsky and the other the dumb Panofsky. <laughs> and uh, they used to tease him. They said, uh, of course, they didn't know how good they were. If they were good, they'd be physicists, but they could always fall back on the history of art if they were failures. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, a, an old friend of mine and a man I think of as a, quite a great man, really. Uh, and that's Harold Chernus, who is that wonderful blend of uh, scholar and philosopher that uh, you don't find very often. His field is Greek, his passion, Plato and Aristotle. And uh, Professor Einstein is still here too, isn't he? Oh, yeah, indeed he is. Uh, indeed he is. Uh, uh, he, is, he is one of the most lovable of men. Does he ever call you up on the telephone? Hmm, sometimes. I think he, he calls me, uh, when he reads in the newspapers, something about me that he doesn't like, and he calls me up and, and says, that's all right, that's just right. <laughs> Niels Bohr is here now as well. Oh, we have many, many people visiting. Yes. Uh, and now I will tell about those that are exciting. I mentioned Piaget to me, but there are many who are many, too many to talk about. Uh, Bohr is here. He's come over and over again, and we have with him an arrangement which we reserve for our best friends, namely he can come whenever he wants. Yes. <laughs> and he spent this semester and will be leaving just in a few days. Uh, we have George Kennan here, who's been here off and on also, and has uh, a, an arrangement not so unlike that of, of Bohr's. He's looking at a very odd episode, maybe, maybe tragic, uh, and that is what the Americans were doing at the time of the Russian Revolution and in the year that followed that. Um, who was representing us and how we got to represent us in Russia, what they thought, what they thought we ought to do, what our government did, and uh, this is going to be quite a yarn when he gets it finished. Uh, well, what about the supply of scientists, the, the manpower pool, the, the training of the younger scientists? I don't know. You see, the, that, that always is a very, I'm very bad about it because I work in my own life with rather few people as students. I, I always have. They wouldn't let me at undergraduates because they afraid I'd confuse them. <laughs> I'd have a dozen or 20 men that I'd work with intimately. This institute has a hundred people. I think in terms of of, of the rather good people rather than the number of them. But there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, the, a lot that's right about it, I mean. Uh, we, we're beginning to catch up on the mechanical side. We're just beginning to realize that if we want people to do very hard things, we've got, and want them to do it irrespective of whether they're rich or poor, we've got to provide money in some way to see them through their training. Uh, if we want them to go into a profession which will never be very remunerative, we, we've got, we won't be successful unless we provide scholarships and that kind of thing. The training is Operation Bootstrap. You, one, one great teacher, one great man of learning uh, changes a country. Denmark has one enormous figure in physics and the whole country is altered by that. Japan has Yukawa. The first Japanese to come to the Institute after the war, and was, who was sent here with MacArthur's blessing as a sign of the new relations between the countries. And now all the bright young Japanese want to learn theoretical physics. Not all, but I mean, I exaggerate. So I think that 
that the statistics and the tables maybe don't tell the whole story. Uh, tell me, is there a very widespread reluctance on the part of scientists in this country to work for the government? No, I don't think so. Uh, this also gets very much distorted when it's, when it's talked about in, in sloganistic terms. Uh, you see, if you, if you take a scientist who is excited by and interested in new discovery, uh, he may have a problem as to whether he wants to do applied science. And for the government, that's what he would be doing. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a legitimate doubt. And if all the scientists in the country did applied science, it would be terrible for us. Uh, I think that scientists like to, to be called in and asked to advise on how to make the Voice of America uh, a better thing. They like to be called in and asked for their counsel. Everybody likes to be treated as though he knew something. Uh, I suppose that, uh, that when the government behaves badly in, in a field you're working close to, when, when decisions that look, look cowardly or or uh, vindictive, or short-sighted, or mean, or made, and that's very close to your area, uh, then you get discouraged, and you may, may, uh, may recite George Herbert's poem, I Will Abroad, but I think that's human rather than scientific. Uh, Dr. Oppenheimer, are you worried about the, uh, all the impediments placed in the way of free intercourse, travel, and exchange amongst scientists. I very, think, very I much. Coming down here, and I think this is true, that uh, uh, had the McCarran Act been in force, neither Fermi nor Savard would ever have been permitted to enter this country, which would have been uh, a rather expensive loss, I think. Yes. Uh, perhaps not even Einstein. <laughs> I don't know. This is terrible. This is it's just terrible, and, uh, and seems a, a holy fantastic and grotesque way to, to, to meet the threat of espionage. Uh, just a, an enormous apparatus, surely not well designed for, for that, and terrible for, for those of us who live with it. it uh, we're, we're rightly ashamed uh, by the contempt that the Europeans have for us. And uh, we're rightly embarrassed that, that uh, we can't hold congresses in this country, that um, we can't, often don't let people go to congresses where the most wanted. Year after year, we've met in Rochester to discuss the kind of basic physics that there's one man who's the world's greatest in this and very, very good. Uh, well, he sends his deputies and his representatives and somebody doesn't come. And that's not one situation. It's over and over again. Um, this is a scandal. Well, sir, apart from running the Institute, uh, what do you do here? Well, I've I do two kinds of things. Um, one is is to write about what I think I know, uh, hoping that it'll be understandable to, to in general. And one is to try to understand physics and to talk and work with the physicists and sometimes have a try to have an idea that may be helpful. And the part of physics that, that I, I try try not to become too ignorant of any part, but the part that that I, I really get excited about is just what is called particle physics or atomic physics in its modern sense. But uh, why are things the way they are? What it is that's, that's conserved, maintained, kept invariant in, in these, these uh, fundamental particles. And, and uh, I've got a scheme here. And the point is that from this, you can then get some notion of whether it really fits with the particles that are found. Here, charge is, is over this way. This is negative particles, neutral, doubly charged, positive, and positive. And uh, this is the neutron and the proton. And up this way is mass. And we don't have this mass scale very well, but just, just as, a, as a schematic thing. And each of these lines then represents a, uh, a particle that ought to live a long time according to, 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 to this scheme. And, uh, this is the most famous. This is found. It's a well-defined energy, and it's been observed very many times. It's a kind of V in the cloud chamber. Uh, the point of the V goes up to the to the nuclear explosion that created it. Uh, tell, tell me this, Dr. Oppenheimer. Uh, do you ever become frightened at what you're finding out here in this area that can't be measured in either time or space? I, you see, that's a real point. Uh, I only get frightened when and it happens very rarely. I, I think I have an idea. 
Uh, that is, what people find isn't frightening, but the understanding of it sometimes has this quality. I remember a man who was my teacher in Göttingen, he's in Chicago now, James Frank. He said, the only way I can tell whether my thoughts are really have some weight to them is the sense of terror when I think of something new. Mm -hmm. Well, so the, the, the kind of order that will come out of this, that is frightening. But the fact that this, you see, is like walking through the woods and seeing that there are different kinds of flowers and it's all very amusing. And so it's when you try to see why there is necessity, why it's this way and no other way. Yeah. Uh, because all you can do here is, is guess in the night and correct in the night. <laughs> <laughs> and you ha have to try to find the mistakes. Is, is it true that... Uh, that humans have already discovered a method of destroying humanity? Well, I suppose that really has always been true. Uh, you could always beat everybody to death. Uh, you mean m to do it by inadvertence? Yes. Uh, not quite. Not quite. Um, you can certainly destroy enough of humanity so that only the greatest act of faith can persuade you that what's left will be human. But this is, this is a matter on which much, much, much more should be known. There's every reason for us to say what we, what we know and above all to say what we don't know. The genetic problems, the problems of what, what might happen in the future to, to the human species as a result of, of having radioactivity in the body or having, having radiation outside, uh, the geneticists don't know enough to be sure of that. We do know what happens if you're near a, an explosion, a bomb explosion. Um, we know it from experience and from common sense. The, the things we know ought to be in the public domain so people are fear, frightened are fearful only in the measure in which fear is justified and, and, uh, and rational. The things that aren't known should be talked about because one of the ways to get things found out is, uh, is to have it clear that, uh, that we don't know the answers. And also one of the ways to, to give people the kind of responsibility and humanity which we would like or think we have is, is that they, they recognize when they don't know something and take their very ignorance into account in their planning. This is too long an answer to your question, it's but I feel very... It, it certainly is not, and it brings me to another one that I wanted to ask very much, and that is that in this era that is more threatened and dominated than any previous one by scientists, their decisions, their discoveries, what about the poor, uninformed civilian? It isn't the layman that's ignorant. It's everybody that's ignorant. The scientist may know a little patch of something, and if he's a humane and intelligent and curious guy, he, he'll know a few spots from other people's work. He may even be able to read a book. But, but his condition is the condition of everyone, which is that almost everything that's known to man, he doesn't know anything about at all, or knows it only in a very sketchy way. And that's because it's, it's gotten a bit complicated. The problem of, of, of a coherent civilization is the problem of of living with ignorance and not, not being frustrated by it. So that you find occasionally a man knows two things. And that intersection may be a great event in the history of ideas. Occasionally uh, a, a man may think that something is relevant or exciting which no one before thought concerned him professionally. That may change the history of the world. And these are the connections these virtual connections, these casual and occasional connections, which make the only kind of coherence we have. That and, and, and affection, that and respect, that and, 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 I suppose, kind of humanity. Now, if you look at the problem of science and government, uh, then, of course, mostly it's not really science. It's, it's, it's pretty much practical application, because no one in the government of the United States needs to worry about whether the isotopic spin or the strangest number are the real invariants of the sum atomic word. They need to know sometimes things that are very hard to answer. Um, can a ballistic rocket enter the, the Earth's atmosphere uh, if it's come a few thousand miles and have a skin that isn't burned up and so on? They need to know uh, is there 
any limit to the size of explosions you can make. I need to know all kinds of technical things. And these are not, in the narrow sense, the frontier of science, but they're technical and complicated. Some will understand one another in one area, some in another, and you'll get a kind of lace work of coherence. And that requires, I used the word affection before, for the government it might be better to say trust, though I think even for the government affection wouldn't be a hopeless word. Take in the government itself, which consists of laymen. Take the, the president or his secretary of state or his secretary of defense. Uh, all he can do is be sure that in one way or another the advice he's being given is subject to criticism. That if, if he gets a statement of how it is, this will cost so many dollars and take so many years, this is impossible, that uh, anyone who has a different view and the professional qualifications that make it interesting can get to it. And uh, I think that isn't too bad in the parts of the government I've been close to, that is the atom and, and the military establishment and the State Department. I think, I think people have been able to, to tell their stories and that uh, that folly has been corrected. But if you mean the people outside the government, yes. and I think that's more important, there, there there's a, a really, a point that I feel most deeply, and I think I speak really now, the voice of, of my, my profession, and that is the integrity of communication. The trouble with secrecy isn't that it inhibits science, could, but in this country it's hardly been used that way. Technical things are, are really quite widely known and those at the growing tip of, 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 of any science are so far from practice that the people, people talk quite freely about them and should. The trouble with secrecy isn't that uh, it doesn't give the public a sense of participation. The trouble with secrecy is that it denies to the government itself the, res the wisdom and the resources of the whole community, of the whole country. And the only way you can do this is to let almost anyone say what he thinks, to try to give the best synopses, the best popularizations, the best mediations of technical things that you can, and to let men deny what they think is false, argue what they think is false, you have to have a free and uncorrupted communication. And this is, this is so the heart of living in a complicated technological world, it is so the heart of freedom, that that is why we are all the time saying, does this really have to be secret? Couldn't you say more about that? Are we really acting in a wise way? Not because we enjoy chattering, um, not because we're not aware of the dangers of the world we live in, but because these dangers cannot be met in any other way. Well, if I may say so, I think you were speaking there not only for your profession, but for mine, if it is a profession. I, I'm sure of that. There aren't, in fact, very many secrets. There aren't secrets about the world of nature. There are secrets about the thoughts and intentions of men. Sometimes they're secret because a man doesn't like to know what he's up to if he can avoid it. <laughs> Dr. Oppenheimer, if enough nations get messing about with hydrogen bombs, is there any danger of contaminating the atmosphere of the fallout being so heavy that we may damage ourselves without meaning to? I'm not unworried about it. Uh, I tend still to worry about war rather than peace. I think, I think the scale of things in these experimental undertakings is, is so vastly smaller and their location so much more secure than, than what you'd expect to, if, the, if the battle were joined or that uh, we'd do well to worry about the latter before the former. That was a brief glimpse of a two-and-a-half-hour conversation with Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer, director of the Institute for Advanced Studies. One thing that impressed this reporter at that institute was that he has never heard so many people say, I don't know. 
These men recognize mystery, they welcome it, and they wrestle with it. Good night, and good luck.